I want to start the session putting Linux into context. And as you could see, there is not only the work by me, it's from a bunch of contributors within the Elisa project. Uh, to give you a short background on who I am, I'm not a traditional kernel developer. I've been writing bootloaders like 10 years back and then I got to the dark side. Now I'm more in the product manager role, but in my spare time or not, I'm also the chair of the technical steering committee within the Elisa project, which is the main part of the talk. Uh, I'm also the member of the Linux Foundation Europe advisory boards. Linux Foundation Europe told me I should say this. So I did this here. Um, yeah, as I said, the main part which I want to talk about is the ELISA project. That's a Linux Foundation project. And ELISA stands for Enabling Linux in Safety Applications. Quick check for the people sitting here who knows the difference between safety and security. Half hands up, that's good. Uh, it's spelled different. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I had a few like ask the expert sessions of it, and then I got a lot of questions about cybersecurity and how we're handling this. And then I explained that safety means something different than security. I come from Germany. There's actually exactly the same word. That's why we often say cybersecurity and functional safety. Functional safety means uh, causing risk to human life and avoiding this risk. So this means not Basically, I'm fine if someone intrudes in my system, as long as my function remains operating, which typically will not do anymore. But if I can even see that something goes wrong, it may be a chance that this is safe. So there's an overlaps in safety and security. Um, but here it's really about the functional safety as such. We have a bunch of members in here uh, which deal with functional safety, which have an interest in putting more responsibility into, for Linux into safety critical systems. And they are from aerospace, from automotive, uh, Red Hat as one, someone pushing very strongly. And then you have a large set of these members working in. And they all subscribe to a mission in the project. Uh, what you can see it says, it's to define common set of elements, processes, and tools. And this basically means, especially processes and tools, that we also have to do a lot of things around just writing code. So basically what set of elements means, this can be the source code which we're providing. And th the end goal is that it will be amenable for safety certification. We're not providing a safety certified Linux from within the project, but we help others, integrators, to do so. And to do this, we split the work into several topics. Um, we have a bunch of safety architecture. This is really going and looking into how kernel operates, how subsystem calls are made. I tell a little about this later, where we used it. The Linux features is a very interesting part. So here it goes more like when you come from security, you know about C group namespaces and so on. And we would like to identify further features and say, if you have these kind of features, they support your safety argumentation. And if you have the security view, you know that just because there is the feature of namespaces, C group and so on, it doesn't mean your system is secure. You still have to do and configure it properly. So we also want to provide more guidance on this. Um, tools investigation, code improvement. This is more also the area where we look how tools are used, that the tools are doing proper things. Sometimes you need to qualify tools. So we check what could go wrong with the tool or also to set up our CI system. The thing I'm not touching today is the open source engineering process. This really checks into how is the development process of the kernel, how does it match with uh, the standard safety standards which they demand. And the system thing should bring different things together. And you're, when you need to create a system uh, in safety space, we often talk about safety elements. And in the automotive, they say safety elements out of context, but to say this, there's nothing which means out of context. You always need a context in which you operate. And that's the start of the talk where I said putting Linux into context. So um, these are use cases. And oh, this was a little fast. We have 
basically three use case groups from the aerospace, which is led by Boeing. There's not the dedicated use case yet. They are in a phoning phase and considering which use case to take. For automotive, we started with this work from automotive grade Linux. You see these instruments cluster, the black one in the top. You may wonder what this speedometer things have to do with safety. In principle, it means um, the gear which you put in the car, it's indicated that you always know that you're having either front or rear gear in so that you're not having the wrong gear by mistakes and hit someone or also that the check engine signs are there. And this actually is safety functionality. And you need to guarantee that these things come in a certain amount of time. From medical devices, this is a very interesting one. I have a little more work of this also in there. This is called Open APS. It's an artificial pancreas system. And it's uh, there and connected to an insulin pump. So if you have a glucose monitor and an insulin pump, normally you get notified by a mobile that you're blood sugar, glucose monitor, whatever changed. And these systems are very, very expensive. So out of the demand and need, uh, Dana and Louise, you can check for the name and some TED Talks, very impressive. She created an own system based on a Raspberry Pi, put on a script of a few hundred lines and let it operate her glucose monitoring and then the insulin pump, which often by medical device manufacturer is that expensive because it could cause a risk to human life. If you have an overdose or something, this is really horrible. But here you see that it's impressively running quite stable for many people. They decide on their own to take this risk. That's maybe the difference that you're not selling it directly as a product, but they set it on demand. I think they have a few thousand users and they are on a pay pass also to certify work of it. Now that's a very important element. And um, these two examples are more pure Linux system as of now, but there is more work where system complexity increase and some challenges are, also let me see where it goes, yeah, there if you use Linux. So normally you would bring this with a certified, typically real-time OS, bring this functionality in and now it's more used for Linux. And why is there the question for Linux and asking to use Linux? So some may say it's cost savings because if you play, pay for a commercial S, uh, you want to save some money, but there's also demand of having more features in. So you know about autonomous driving, you have very complex, many core computing systems. And at a certain point of time, the certified systems don't scale anymore. You don't find proper libraries. You cannot look into this cross code because it's typically closed source binaries. And so when you want to approach complex use cases, you either have to go into the, oh, I get more enhancement of the safety certified OS, which is very hard to influence, or I bring a safety parse towards Linux and then put it in combination. T to get a feeling on uh, what means safety for Linux, uh, yeah, some topics are definitely memory management is seen as not safe. Dynamic memory allocation, not safe. Caches, not safe. safe. Interrupt handling, also not safe. Real-time scheduling, well, we're doing progress with there, but if you talk to the safety guys, sometimes they would also say uh, Zephyr is not an RTOS and it's not real-time because real-time is really when just do bare metal. So this is something where we have clash of worlds a little bit by this and where later also would like to uh, request certain support from community also to get a bit more understanding on topics. Right. What helps us to work around these things is a lot of tools. So we need to increase the understanding. We need to understand what goes wrong in systems, what are crucial elements. Uh, STPA is a system theoretic process analysis. I spent two slides on this uh, here. And then also on the S-Trace C-Scope, something which we did as workload tracing based on the results. KSNF was an extension of this. So we, we have these kind of things in the ELISA project. Some parts are upstream, some not yet, but just on our GitHub. Uh, SDPA is a very interesting thing. If you're involved in device designing systems, so this basically is a handbook for Nancy G. Levinson and John P. Thomas. You can just search for it. It's free and I also have the link in the slides. So you can just click on it and it's worth reading like the first parts up 
to page 50 and then somewhere in the appendix on why you should analyze complex systems. And it actually also works to do your electricity in the house properly. So it's a quite flexible approach. Um, the idea of this is that you are jumping over this, that you have some elements like a controller and a controlled process. And this you will do for your complete system. So you have something which yeah, sends and control action, sensor actuator model, and then you get feedback because you want to know what happened. And you basically check what are unsafe control actions. So what could go wrong? The nice thing about this one compared to drawing really formal models is that you can put in people or hardware, software, environment. You could basically give everything being a controller or also being a control process. This is an example of the open APS system at the first level of analysis where everything was just put in like, oh, we have an application developer. And this is also something involved in this whole topic. So you can say, here's an application developer, here's a user, and you put all this in there. And this was the first level. And this blue box was then further extended to just check what is the Raspberry Pi really doing on this? And what is the algorithm doing? What is in the interactions between. And we wanted to go one step further and check what the kernel does, and we failed, basically. So it's getting very, very complex to just use this analysis without any usage of further tools. And here, uh, we came up with a workload tracing with work from Shua and Shefali. She did a, they both did a lot of work on this. They mainly used S-Trace and C-Scope. And what we extracted was what are relevant system calls for this workload. So when open APS systems is in operation, what can happen? Which calls are there? Uh, how often are they called? Why are they called? And this also, yes, I'm going have it on next slide. Yeah. So this is something which later on in general case was upstreamed also. So you find it now in the admin guide. And it's also the place where we plan to have more things uploaded in the coming years and work we have. So we see that there's a lot of things still open. Other updates are also in the field of man pages because we see there is a not always a matching implementation to what we see in, see in the man pages. This will also help to improve safety quality. And um, for workload tracing, as said, this is mainly on of seeing what's running, but we also sometimes want to see what is left and right, what could be called, but maybe was not called by the workload. And for this, there was work from uh, Alessandro and Maurizio, I guess. Yeah, I hope at both. Alessandro and Maurizio at the beginning, at the end. Um, this is something which we haven't upstream yet. We were wondering if it makes sense to put it somewhere. Basically, it's a tool which can be used to do a static analysis of your kernel configuration, and then you get incredible call trees sometimes, which you need to narrow down to what is important for you. But you can really get a feeling on what do I need of a kernel, what do I don't need? Because if you are in safety critical system, you need to strip down things really to the detail of what is needed. So um, I made it bold. Is there a good place to upstream? Maybe we can discuss later if there's a view in the audience. Uh, and this was one thing where we had some upstream, but we also came up with further topics. So uh, if you have a use case, this brings different ideas on what to focus on, what is important to look at. There are also some topics which may be independent of the use case, which every use case shares. So um, it's something which we recently started to discuss if there is a core of a kernel. And this could be in this, what's in the orange box, like synchronization, timing, interrupt, exception, handling, resource management, memory allocation, basically a lot of things which you have also seen in what is considered as not safe by the safety community. But also additions like initialization, parts, how does a bootloader place into the game? So we haven't, we had this, this talk yesterday morning from TI where also the bootloader was really brought into the topic of safety. So this is something which we haven't touched yet. What we touched was work on preempt RT and real-time analysis tooling. So this is something where we are also still working in, where we want to progress. Uh, all the results should be upstream documentation part at the end. 
and it should help integrators, people who build system, that you get a better system understanding. And I hope it's also helpful for others, not only in the safety environment. Uh, here is something which I just saw. It says add link to their presentation here. I missed this in my review. So uh, on the uploaded version, you have the link to the presentation which Shua and Alana gave during the years this year. It gives you an hour overview on basically things they have analyzed, how to use preempt RT, how to configure things, how to do analysis of workloads which you have. And this is the base where it should start on getting more upstreamed. And there was a request also by Alana as a worker, please. She said, if, if you're there, promote that we still look for people who are really using it in practice, who are experts also, that we write the proper documentation on it. So it's always good to have more than two eyes or four eyes in there. And yeah, if, if you look also in the admin guide, you see currently there is nothing for preempt RT as really something in user admin guide. Okay. Uh, yeah, real time is something which you find in many different systems actually. And this is now also the part of this really system creation. So you can see that I put different scale of use cases. So the most simple one would be our, maybe a, a lawnmower or also your vacuum cleaner at home, which actually involves due to app functionality, due to getting cameras involved, due to having sensor data. It's not really a safety use case if it's not hunting your hamster or something like this, but uh, it combines already multi-chip, multi-core processors with microcontrollers with certain real-time capabilities. And basically it's not too much different if you see a vacuum cleaner lawnmower from something going out in the field in agriculture, because they also have like a square which they clean and there may be obstacles in there in a controlled environment or a mining vehicle operating somewhere in a larger site. And this is also the fundamental principle of an autonomous driving car, because in the end, your vacuum cleaner is an autonomous driving vehicle, just on a smaller scale. And these architectures are very similar. And this is also what we are uh, going that fast. Yeah. What we saw with other communities. So um, when we discussed about the systems work group, it, the idea was basically to have an industrial work group first. And it was not an industry use case as such when talking to the Xen people, to Zephyr, especially with Xen, we figured out, oh, there is a similar strategy currently from Stefano Stabilini. So he was presenting something last year that's in June timeframe in Boston, I guess. Yeah, on the open source summit. Uh, he also created a reference system. So I have the slides later on, just the information for it which is exactly the similar setup which we used here for our reproduction. And also checking then with, especially I come from automotive, that's why you will see the automotive examples in there. With AGL, SOFI, SDV, they have quite comparable architectures with complexity of having heterogeneous systems and not only Linux in there. And this was a strong concern for us uh, because our work groups within Elisa mainly concentrate on Linux and there's a strong risk of forgetting what's left and right of it. And that's why we said it's good to have a real system set up, share the ideas to get a better outreach and see which other communities also share the same problem. <coughs> to give you an idea, I took a screenshot from the SOFI architecture version. So you find high compute CPUs, you find safety CPUs with hypervisors involved, Arcturus, multiple OS, Arctos being then also on the hypervisor. So you find these system elements in here and in a little bit smaller scale, uh, we figured out, well, let's try to build one of these things. And this is basically the story which we had with Stefano. He also said, the people are listening to my talk since years, but it's very hard for them to reproduce whatever I've done. So this year, and it was last year, I will present how to reproduce the system. So that's what he did with the static partition on. And he actually had Xen Linux RT and Zephyr in the system. And this is where we also based our work on. But uh, yeah, the presentation he gave was mainly concentrating on what can be done with Xen and was less on uh, really like a creating of complete system. He just grabbed uh, a Yocto 
Peter Linux, whatever they had from where you could find an image. And for Zephyr, he also just said, like, I don't care. I just got an image. I concentrate on the Xen work. And we said, OK, we want to have the full flow. So we want to build the Yocto Linux, the Debian Linux. We want to have Zephyr build. And it should be all reproducible that someone can take it up. And it should run on real hardware, because uh, the work was on QAMO, which Stefan was quite clever in doing so. Um, because when you look into real hardware, you typically end up with a bunch of challenges. So you saw that we have some graphics involvement. Uh, this was actually the killer point which we had at the end for our systems, which we looked at. This was proprietary GPU drivers, and we wanted to share them with a CI build with the community so that everybody can download. We failed. And other parts was also, well, you need to have good support when you have embedded hardware, how to get things on. Is there actually community support available? Um, if you have sometimes community support, it may be tools where you rely on, which are not in a very healthy state. So better look for which project to utilize. Uh, what do you do with the images, proper handling of it? Is it safe to just upload them somewhere, which will ask us to choose, and then at the end, uh, we're still on the way on it, create a full S-bomb on it, because we want to make sure that the license are used properly and we want to know what's in the system, why it's in there, and which version. Right. Uh, here I give a big thanks to Thomas and to Sudip, because they are the two people which mainly create the system and playing force and back. Currently, so Thomas typically does the prototyping. He sets the things together. He writes the guide. And then uh, Sudip picks it up and tries to understand what Thomas does. And by this, we get a documentation for the things. And Thomas is doing it on real world. And Sudip brings it into the CI. So what we found as major challenges during setting up such a Xen system was how to get a good hardware support for Xen. Not everybody supports it in the same way. Uh, is there documentation there? Do we have license compliance? Then another thing, which Yocto to use, because Xen comes with a Peter Linux Yocto, but there's also the Yocto Yocto, or Yocto Poki part with the uh, meta virtualization layer. So this is something then, uh, how much resources you use, Yocto has shared resources, but this turned out to be some issues for parts of the community, which said, well, yeah, I would like to do a build, but it's just taking too much time because my power, my PC is not strong enough. Or they said, uh, well, I have the computation performance, but I don't have disk space anymore. So these kind of things, then, uh, yeah, this was all elements which we had during, from a software perspective of finding a starting point. <laughs> we also differ, uh, we also check different targets. So we uh, start with the Renaissance Archer because we know there's good support for Xen in there. We also have the Xilinx in there because there's good Xen support. Uh, the Renaissance hardware was also in the AGL as a reference hardware. Xilinx was discontinued, but was basically also in. So. But I said we had issues with proprietary graphics. So there you can have a click-through license for the normal drivers. But if you go for virtualization, virtualized drivers, you get on thin ice. So we said, oh, let's take the sidings one. We get a good start. And then we figured out the hardware which we use does not support proper high graphics hardware virtualization. So we can do software rendering and so on. But that's nothing which we wanted to have as features. Right. Then uh, we checked other options. So we went to his QEMO but QEMO performance is a little bit slower. You don't have all the devices. Graphics rendering is even more slow. Uh, still a very good option. So I always recommend to have also QEMO setups. The Raspberry Pi we considered because it's more community hardware, a little bit cheaper. But uh, if you want to go deeper and have a real use case, you may want to go for system MMU levels. You want to make sure that you can really partition things. We had a short look in the i.mx8 system. They were looking quite good overall, but uh, they were from regarding Xen had less than one community support and were also not that available at the time when we started looking at it. So we ended up with the Xu hardware and uh, brought things then into an example system. This is actually quite small also from my side, but um, you can see on the blue boxes what are elements from different BSP perspectives. So we 
had parts where we used the uh, Xilinx Yocto directly because it was not all available in plain Yocto Pokey. Uh, we, you see a purchase build. This is something which is an embedded industrial Debian derivative. Um, it's basically in there because it's something which we have in Bosch together with Colabra. And Thomas, who does the system, uh, knows by heart since many years how to do Debian distros and images. So that's why you also have a patch support there. Interesting to see us that due to the, um, the, the death fire part, we could directly take one on one from the archive. So this was something very nice to see because it's a plain Zephyr. It runs on top of Xen and it just is there for the Cortex A support. So you just take the image as such and it does what it should. So this was quite nice to see. Uh, yeah, and there was also just the alternative to just take a Peter Linux. We are now in the process of getting it plain Yocto Pokey to get independent of the Xilinx work and have a more direct relationship. Then you need to attach a lot of devices and so on. And I'm not sure if I left this in the presentation, but there's a bunch of example configurations, a lot of links to click through so that you really can see. Oh yeah, here it comes. So everything I use this as a kind of documentation. You will find what are the sources, how we created the image. If you are on the GitHub page, you also see the guidelines how to set up a such a system and where you find everything. So we use this as a pre-stage for documentation before we have everything in GitHub. Right. Uh, on that set, it should also end up in a CI. So we already have set up a GitLab CI. And in this, uh, we split jobs for having the build and then the packaging of it. And it runs on a daily base. What you may see on the right, we have artifacts for download, but we only have the latest artifact available, the latest images. Sometimes you see two days, but the idea is that if you came across development, at least I had it when I went somewhere and said, oh, can you show me? I have an issue. Oh, where does the issue come from? Yeah, it's in this area. So what build are you using? I, I use this build. And say, oh, that's a few ye few weeks old. Oh, but I modified a lot of things on it. So this is something which you see. And we said, you always get this latest one. If we end up with an issue, let's make sure we are running in the same environment. We have a reproducible setup and that's why you don't find last downloads. And this also means if someone implements a feature, it gets into the CI and you will the next day have the latest setup on it and only the latest one. Uh, it's kept longer if it breaks. So it broke two or three times already, not in the systems work group, but in the other setups, typically due to the CAN controller. So there was CAN stack changes, there were certificates expiring and so on. This was really important to see that we had a booting system and also QA checks at the end and have a so full flow. And this is something which I guess come from that slide. Yeah, this was a step which we said we came from Meta Eliza. This is our automotive use case. And we wanted to have an environment where everybody can start at the place where the person would like to start. So you can say, I really would like to see the starting point from just following guidelines. You read through it. Then you can you figure out this was something by learning that people say, oh, I cannot build properly. And a while discussion, the one person was on the Ubuntu, the other one was an op using OpenSUSE Tumbleweed because his CPU was not supported by Ubuntu properly. So he went to the latest greater thing and then the infrastructure was not proper. So we ended up with saying, let's build, take a Docker container on this, do containerization because then we have a reproducible environment, avoid this resources we already said. So we have an S state which gets updated once a week to make all sure that it still builds. Otherwise we just build deltas and we have binaries to download. This is also important because not everybody wanted to build. Some just said, I would like to see the system booting, try out, add maybe something. And uh, by this, we have multiple entry points where you can just get in. This is all in a fully dependency flow, which means whenever the documentation change, the Docker file will pull the new Meta Eliza layer, creates the image and the actual Docker image, which you will download for your development, is also the image which the GitLab takes. And the generated QAMO image you will, can also download. And exactly this image is also taken by the OpenQA for testing. So it's not that you download anything which is not in this flow, which should mean when you change something at one part of this queue, it will potentially fail and then you can observe it. The idea is that uh, if someone takes it up, 
like starting with the QAMO image, it shouldn't be the point that the QAMO image still works while the documentation of the meta ELISA is no longer matching. So it should be fully dependable and rely on each other that you can identify last worst case with a failing test case that it's caused because of changing in the meta ELISA or somewhere in between. So you get a fully dependable flow on this. Or why does it running like fast? Yeah, you have the motivation and full description in our blog post on this. What we see now for uh, the example system with exciting Sue, we don't have all sources yet in Metalizer because we grab a lot of things around. It's not directly so it's other sources from different places. So we getting them together, but still the Docker image is the same image for the automotive use case from before. And the one which is built here, we also have a generated image. And what we currently miss is the testing because uh, yeah, there are certain features which are not that easy. I said that there's no full graphics support. The OpenQA relies on graphics. And then also the cost is 3.5K, I guess, for Xilinx Subboard. So it's very, it's very, very expensive. So we look for alternative hardware. We're currently considering to have the QEMO next to it because one really brilliant thing is that the Xilinx implementation is very close to hardware. So you miss, of course, some device that will not be an iSquare C bus, which you can check, or certain SD card for the peripherals also. But the whole setup of the Xilinx 2 part is reproducible. So basically, the images which you produce for the real hardware also run in QEMO. It gives a few errors if you have a improper configuration because not all interfaces are there. But in this way, in the next step, we will be able to have also our images tested with QMO. Uh, still, we would like to get more diversity in. I think that's on the, yeah. Uh, what the intention was of this system composition is also it should be reproducible. We're on a good way on it. But if we have reached this reproducibility, I'm pretty sure someone will said, but I'm not using the fire. I'm using free artists. Oh, I would like to go with another hypervisor. Or someone says, I'm not a Yorktop guy, I'm more a Debian person, or the other way around. And we would like to have at least always one alternative. And the idea behind is, if you have an alternative, you really figure out what is the interface between the different systems. So how do I am interacting with Linux? What makes a differentiating part? What are commonalities if I change from DevFire to FreeRTOS, if I take XN and KVM or jailhouse or whatever I have. And also for hardware, we know that some things behave quite strange. If you go for Yocto, you know, if you have one Yocto build for say, uh, oh, we have TI here. So if we have a TI Yocto, it most likely does not behave exactly the same way like the NXP Yocto, maybe due to versions, modification or something. So we said, let's take also two hardware versions in there. And if we are really able to just create variations of these hardware, you can start to learn how do I design my own system. And this is the one side, so everybody can learn which systems get in. The second side on this is we want to bring in the functionality. So if we now have our preempt RT work done and have certain configuration there, if we update kernel configurations, we all bring this in the reference system so that you can experience also results from our analysis, which we've done in the work group. For this, uh, need to change the order. So I put a little bit of overview on uh, topics where we are working on and where we could also just need a little bit more of support. So I showed you the workload tracing. This worked very well. We have this upstream. Still, um, the scripting is on a Raspbian. Uh, we don't have an S bomb on this, so we have still a lot of work to do. So it would be quite interesting if there's someone who is willing and say, oh, I have experience. For me, it's just straightforward to just bring this workload thing up and get our Yocto build for the Raspberry Pi or for an alternative hardware and run this workload from the medical devices on it. So this would be very helpful. Uh, for preempt RT, I mentioned it already. We had good discussions also, uh, also with Daniel Bristol, who was supporting us, giving us some information. Uh, Unitronics people telling us more about RT preempt RT. 
but to have also user perspective in there and help to get the upstream documentation, this would be really nice. And my original starting point basically from this system here, if you say, oh, that's my favorite hypervisor and this is well supported, or I know this virtualization brings graphics support with this hardware, or this is a really good supported community board. This is something which I would love to hear. Then we create it more and get another run on this on our CI system so that you can download things. And then the last part of this was uh, like more on this core components to get more technical deep dives. They were very useful for us. Um, we also did deep dives, for example, on the watchdog subsystem. And we figured out that the standard watchdog in the Linux kernel has a one second granularity. We would definitely need to go down for a 10 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds granularity for watchdog if we target automotive use cases. So this is some discussion which we had like two years back uh, and may need to continue on it again to just see how how does it fit. But at the point when we started, we were saw that we break interfaces from the existing watchdog. And by this, we would need to end up with a new discussion how to not break the interfaces. And do we see someone who already said there's a good value in it before we just upstream something so tremendously? Right. Uh, and this part would end up with kernel patches, documentation in the admin guide man pages. Some part may end up in our GitHub repo if it doesn't make sense to have it directly in kernel org. And what we bring from the Lisa project is really that we have a bunch of people which have strong expertise in safety and systems engineering. And they are good in analyzing the things, asking the proper questions and get a good understanding how things should operate. But they are not kernel developers in the first role. And there it's really good to find this exchange, bridge a little bit, enable the conversation on it. So this is uh, where we would like to get more support also a little bit where there's willingness. It can be just starting smaller sessions or so, uh, giving a kind of seminar, webinar with something which we did in the past and that we have more and have a pause for more upstreaming. And I believe that this will be very valuable also for a lot of other work which is uh, going on because in the end, this makes it, the whole kernel more robust, more reliable, dependable, independent of later use and safety. So it's just like higher quality to already high quality environment. And by this, I conclude. Any questions? Get a catch box. I think there's one over there. I don't know if the one which is following people. Um, I'm I'm interested in the current state of the QM emulation. I heard you said um, not all ha hardware is working, but is it basically possible that I download your latest image, have somewhere a QMO command line, and it basically works? So more so this, this one here, you can see from the pipeline. There's the open QA and this one really boots yeah. the system, logs in, starts the uh, telltale use case and uh, takes a screenshot and does a screenshot comparison if the safety mechanism works. Okay. And this you can you can just, if you go for the link, I think I have all links for all the uh -huh. artifacts in there, but this is for the plain Linux one. That's good. And we have this one in plan. So this is just the work where okay. this week, next week, this is go on to have it also for this other system uh, with Xilinx hardware, but then you will not have a graphical interface, but you can log in. So the okay, test cool. case will go up to cool. use the QEMO image, it boots, you can log in. And is there work ongoing like uh, extending QMO to support more hardware, or are you mainly focusing on getting real hardware? We want to focus a little bit on getting real hardware. So uh, we had some use case because we know that peripherals will be used like USB other, there are interfaces, but we said we would try to find a more community friendly hardware yeah. because especially if you go for industry, they use QMO for testing, but they typically don't want to see it. And we want to get it a little bit more close to reality, seeing industry adopting it. And by this, we were looking for mm. hardware and putting it in a fancy looking case that it doesn't sure, look sure, sure. like in Raspberry Pi. <laughs> Uh, but may, I'm very interested in your image. Thank you. That's cool. Have you tried any of the TI platforms like Beagle Play or something like that? Uh, that? If you say it's a good one, then we're interested. So I guess the signings came from the good sense support. 
right? So that's why we saw and the renders came from AGL. So we were more like uh, event driven, like whatever event popped up to show us it's the hardware. And as there was no TI starting point, I guess currently we we just I saw the talk yesterday. So this would be something where it's like, okay, maybe I should consider the TI work more and see what functionality is supported, which hypervisor you have, and then so yeah. yeah. So I definitely would like to see. But my criteria is in best case I have virtualized graphics because a lot of use case requires something to display. Mm -hmm. And even more, it should be community friendly. But we find hardware which is below a certain like say three hundred dollar range or in this range of it, rather than three point five K for this yep. hardware. So uh, BeagleBoard has come up with Beagle plays that are based on the AM six two SOCs. I think there would be something in the price range that you're looking for. Yeah. And I know they also fit a good of bunch of use cases, and they have also the chance to combine safety and uh, performance, right? So from mm -hmm. the setup of CPUs and SOCs, at least an argumentation pass in there. So there's good argumentation to use such hardware. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. There's one more over there. Um, so we should talk afterwards on. Running plain Pocky on on Xilinx hardware and uh, hard Xilinx QEMU, yeah. but um, so what is your criteria for for graphics? You said virtualization. So there's lots of ways to do that. Are you talking about hardware virtualization? The best case, yes, this was something where uh, the Xilinx XU hardware base, the old one, doesn't have full virtualization support in the GPU. Um, we may need to have find compromises and say we need to change our idea on the use case and narrow it down. But we have needs to have a certain performance and best case have two gas, which can from two gas share graphics. It would be. Good. I mean, are, do you consider a vert I/O based either be, vert I/O GPU pass through or or could virtual? Could be an option. Yeah, we would discuss it and then potentially say this is a use case enablement and this is why it may not be a final good use for safety or where you need to be careful in the argumentation. This we would document then. Good. Thanks a lot.